her grandmother shields her grandkids as bullets fly through her home for the second time in a year. Need a stroke survivor turned wrestling warrior and find out what furry creature made a very dramatic entrance this shopping season. These stories and more coming up next on the NKU World Report. Welcome to the NKU World Report, I'm Noah Miller. Gas prices are defined odds and still dropping and it's welcomes news new for consumers as we head into the winter holidays. But there are growing concerns that a key OPIC meeting this week plus two ongoing wars could dispute that trend. In today's Consumer Watch, a look at all this plus how long experts say the low prices at the pump will stick around. A gift at the gas pump just in time for the holidays. Gas prices are still dropping and leaving more jingle in consumers' pockets. It's the longest decline that we've seen since the summer of 2022. Despite a series of threats that suggested the opposite could happen, gas prices have now fallen every day since their peak on September 18th. According to AAA, that's a streak of more than 61 consecutive days. That significant drop comes despite Russia's ongoing war on Ukraine and the Israel-Hamas conflict. That's the good news for the next few months. The bad news is that if Middle East tensions remain high into the first quarter of 2024, then you'll see gasoline prices move up independently of crude. According to AAA, the average price for a gallon of regular gas stood at 325 on Wednesday. That's down 25 cents from a month ago. Right now, 15 states are averaging $3 or less for a gallon of gas, according to AAA, and there are now more than 20,000 gas stations selling gas at $2.75 a gallon or less. That's according to Gas Buddy, which says you can expect those low prices for the next several months. I do expect that between now and, say, Valentine's Day of next year, gas prices should be in the low $3 range nationally, with many states falling below that $3 a gallon mark. Meanwhile, OPEC and its allies have a critical meeting scheduled this week, and experts say the outcome of that gathering could impact prices at your local gas station. That OPEC meeting could hold the key to future gas prices. For Consumer Watch, I'm Mike Valerio. A new report by the New York Times says there are glaring vulnerabilities in the nation's aviation safety system. The paper highlights several incidents where staffing shortages and working conditions have stretched air traffic controllers to the limit, physically and mentally. Federal officials say they know that the air traffic controllers are under immense strain, but it could take years to fully address the factors behind it. Lauren Aguirre has more. When we look at air traffic control equipment, we're, we're using aging equipment, paper strips, uh, we don't have ground radars at our, most of our facilities. But it's not just an aging infrastructure putting air travelers in potentially grave danger. A blistering New York Times report says controllers are being pushed to the brink. Using open records requests, the Times found reports of some controllers admitting to being drunk, smoking marijuana, or experiencing violence on the job, in some cases even sleeping during a shift. The National Air Traffic Controllers Association tells CNN controllers are overworked and understaffed. The shortage is a big problem. Uh, and if you look at how long it takes to get a certified air traffic controller uh, from the academy to certified in the facility could take two to three years. My initial uh, focus has been on how to make these numbers go up quickly without lowering standards. The National Airspace System Safety Review Team points out that the current federal hiring plan, when factoring in retirements and other attrition, brings on fewer than 200 new controllers by 2032. Some relief could come from the FAA's Collegiate Training Initiative, which fast-tracks getting controllers into control towers using select colleges and universities. Get new people into the facilities, get them certified. It's going to take, you know, two to three years, but we'll be caught up and we'll start to actually see uh, more than six controllers a year uh, increase. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. A grandmother in Washington, D.C. shielded her grandsons as her home was riddled with bullets this past weekend. It's the second time in a year that gun violence has hit close to home for her family. Across the board, violent crime is up this year in the district. Homicides have topped a 20-year high, and there's still a month left to go until the end of the year. Sam Ford reports. A worse nightmare. You're in your home with grandsons ages 2 and 7, then you're ducking bullets. Lots of them. Look, one, they were coming through. They were coming through the door, the wall, coming this way now. They were flying through this window, too. 
Aisha Goodman showing us what happened Sunday afternoon as she and her grandchildren were snacking on Thanksgiving leftovers. Then bullets come through the windows of their playroom. I looked at both of them and I said, let's go and crawl fast. So we crawled into that bathroom and I could hear stuff whizzing. So I'm on the floor in the corner and I'm just telling my grandson, once I got them over, I just covered them up and I didn't know whether they got hit or not. I just wasn't, wasn't ready to move and they were scared. She's lived here eight years, but in the last year. This is the second time my house has gotten shot up. She said in April she injured herself fleeing gunfire when this young man was killed outside a nearby building in the 200 block of the Northwest. Still no arrest in that murder. She says she never lets her grandchildren play on this equipment in front of her place because frequently they are young men here who are smoking, drinking, urinating, fighting. And she says perhaps they were the target yesterday. In the home today, we saw books Grandma reads, one called Dream to Be from A to Z. After what happened Sunday, the seven-year-old had a question. Why do men shoot? Why do they shoot? And I, it, I kept saying, I don't know, baby. I, I don't know. She said she's afraid for the grandkids to come back over. She wants to move. Now over to Trey Egan to take a look at sports. A stroke survivor is now a wrestling warrior. She turned to wrestling in her recovery, and now she's going to take the ring in a blizzard brawl. Find out more when we come back. Care. I never knew when I would have to move, so I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. I'm Jenny Garth, and as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. This is unacceptable, and something Feeding America is working to solve. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States, including yours. See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Dad? Just one minute, okay? Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Welcome back. I'm Trey Egan with today's sports report. Last winter, Fisk University was the first historically black college to launch a gymnastics team. They took the sport by storm, and now Fisk gymnasts are doing it again. On MLK Day next month, the team will bring together five other squads with history-making coaches. Hannah McDonald reports. The Fisk University gymnastics team is a family. Their unique sisterhood formed roughly a year ago. I just have this connection that I can't really like put my finger on. It's just the whole team. We just all, we all just clicked as soon as I got here. When Fisk launched its gymnastics program, it became the first historically black college and university to do so. Had we not been successful, we might have been the only one forever. Head coach Corrine Tarver. There's good mistakes and then there's silly mistakes. That was a good mistake. Is proud of the team's trajectory. This had an amazing year last year and showed HBCUs how basically black girl magic can work. The all black team finished their first season with a bang. So is that going to give us our confidence back now? Okay. The program's second competition season will start with one too. It is 
going to be historic. It's something that's never been done before. The gymnasts will compete against five other college gymnastics teams on Martin Luther King Jr. Day at Vanderbilt University's Memorial Gym. Each of the teams is coached by a woman of color. Yeah! That one event could have the potential to, to just have a ripple effect that a lot of other institutions that may have thought about it, now I think they'll think about it a little bit more. Fisk's athletic director says college gymnastics could be more diverse. I know that there are girls all across the world who have had the same dream that some of these young ladies have held to know that they are a part of the group that was some of the first. I, I think it's, it's something that they'll hold in their hearts forever. <laughs> So funny. <laughs> the team in gold and blue, now becoming the blueprint for others. Gymnastics is a predominantly white sport, and just being around people who look like me, who understand just me, it's always a comforting feeling. So just the fact that this was finally being like an opportunity to be a part of, I just I knew this was the right thing. Saturday, top pro wrestlers from around Wisconsin will take to the ring for the Blizzard Brawl. The show features a women's title match with a wrestler who knows a thing or two about fighting for her life. Emerson Lehman has her story. Before she was training to win a title fight at Blizzard Brawl 2023 as Harley Jane, Sophia Gadaudis was in a fight for her life. She only had a 15% chance of surviving this stroke. At the age of 19, Lily Gadaudis' daughter was left paralyzed following a rare stroke. For the two hours, I just, we prayed, you know, you call up all your friends, but you get prepared to say goodbye. The odds were stacked against the young woman, but they hadn't faced a fighter like this. If someone tell me I can't do it, I have to go and do it. Sophia survived the surgery, but her road to recovery was going to be anything but easy. She had to learn to walk again, talk again, how to chew food. When you don't food something right back, you just depress. Then an unlikely solution. After physical therapy, I thought having a hard day, I would turn on restaurant, and it saved my life. In 2021, on a trip to Chicago to watch the All Elite Wrestling Tour, everything clicked. I just saw him biffing and doing moves, and I told my mom and my dad, hey, I can do it. Why not me? She applied to a wrestling academy in Texas to learn from one of her favorite wrestlers of all time, and a legend of the sport, Dustin Rhodes. I hope one day to be with WWE or AEW. I know I will one day. On Saturday night, the 24-year-old Harley James focuses on the Great Lakes Championship wrestling title belt. As for Sophia, she hopes her journey will inspire others who never give up. It was hard for me to keep going, but I did it with my family and my friends, you know, and wrestling. <laughs> She's a fighter. She's never going to stop fighting. Now I'm back to Noah Miller at the news desk. It's a type of depression that can happen during the changing seasons. Most of the time, those experiencing season, seasonal affective disorder feel it in the fall and winter. Some may not even know they have it. In today's Health Minute, Mandy Gay, there is five signs of the disorder and how you can cope. Weather is changing. The days feel shorter. It's colder, more dreary, and getting darker earlier. These can all be triggers for seasonal affective disorder. When it occurs in 1 to 10% of Americans, it's more common amongst females and people who live in colder climates. Psychologist Susan Albers with Cleveland Clinic says this disorder is caused by a shift in the seasons, which disrupts our circadian rhythms with less sun exposure. This in turn interrupts our natural internal clock. As a result, there is a drop in serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that regulates our mood, as well as melatonin, which regulates sleep. Albert says to watch out for five signs, feeling down or unmotivated, loss of interest in things you used to enjoy, shifts in appetite, like eating more or craving carbohydrates, changes in sleep, usually sleeping too much, and loss of energy. The symptoms are similar to depression, but they are much milder and they pass when the spring arrives. Albert says light lamps can help. They mimic outdoor light. She recommends 20 minutes each morning. Since you're not getting as much vitamin D from the sun, eat foods rich in it. Albert suggests salmon, mushrooms, eggs, fortified bread, and milk. 
And finally, try cognitive behavioral therapy. This will help to change some of the negative thoughts you're having during the winter months, as well as establish healthy routines around sleeping and eating. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Let's take a look at entertainment with Candy Durbin. A house on wheels leads a high-speed chase, and a middle school opens its own barber shop in school. Coming up after the break. I don't remember how it started. Start the dance. Oh Our back and forth. It always came back. Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. Welcome back, I'm Kennedy Durbin with your entertainment report. Today in entertainment news, your first look at a big new movie and two Academy Award winners make history. Here's David Daniel with the Hollywood Minute. Carl can't stop this on his own. He won't be alone. This is, it's important to note, the first broadcast show ever to focus exclusively on the achievements of the disabled. Which leads me first time the show, which honors representation of disability in TV and film, was broadcast on television, but Oscar winners Marley Matlin and Troy Kotsur were the first pair of deaf actors ever to host an award show. The Media Access Awards aired Sunday, the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and will repeat on PBS stations and the PBS app. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. A daring and dumbfounding chase unfolded when a driver towing a huge mobile home tried to flee from a traffic stop. Jeremy Roth has today's Take a Look at This. You work in news long enough, you'll see video of chase suspects using all manner of vehicles to try and escape the authorities. In this latest chase, a suspect who allegedly fled a traffic stop took everything with him but the kitchen sink. Hey, what's that? Oh, scratch that, the kitchen sink was included. The driver led Missouri authorities on a winding roadway chase while hauling an entire mobile home. But don't take my word for it, here's an officer's colorful recounting. We chased this truck down the road. He was going about 30 mile an hour. He was hauling this big old house. One of my officers didn't, uh, didn't spike strip him. Fast enough. Officers did eventually stop the driver and make an arrest, saying the suspect traded this mobile house for the big house. And then uh, we took him to jail. Wait, wait. 
Speaking of not-so-smooth criminals, surveillance video from a smash-and-grab job in Maine shows a bumbling suspect trying repeatedly to make off with some cartons of cigarettes, and, well, it doesn't go so well. The slip-sliding suspect did eventually make off with some loot, and in their pursuit, police shared the video online, allowing social media to do what social media does so well. Okay, let's cut to some good news, shall we? A Massachusetts middle school has opened a real barber shop on site, offering free haircuts to students all day long. You heard that right. Haircuts are zero dollars. Well, what about fades, you say? Also, zero dollars. Well, what about blowouts? <clears throat> what did I just say? The on-site snip shop at Sullivan Middle was funded by a grant and is state-sanctioned and aims to help families that may not have the time or money to book appointments and to give students a fresh-cut confidence boost. For Take a Look at This... I'm Jeremy Roth. Now back to Noah Miller at the news desk. A Michigan business was damaged after a deer crashed through the front door. Deanna Giles spoke with the owner who said she had to close the store for a day as a result of the mess the buck made. But she's just glad no one got hurt. Encountered a little bit of a, a wild adventure. An adventure you don't see every day in Old Town. We had a deer leap through our glass door and create an entire ruckus all the way around the shop. Lauren Palmer is the owner of Curvaceous Lingerie. On Saturday, employees and customers received a not-so-friendly visit from a deer. Everybody pretty much kind of remained somewhat calm and uh, just stayed out of the way. This was a big buck. It was not a small doe by any means. I mean, you were not going to mess with this deer. The deer destroying fixtures, tables, mannequins, and mirrors. Palmer says no one inside the store was hurt. The uh, gals that were in the shop at the time, you know, um, one of them was very level-headed. One of them was a little bit more panicked because she doesn't love animals. It wasn't until one of the employees opened the door and the deer eventually left. After, the community immediately pitched in to help clean up. Although Palmer says this came at an unfortunate time. We've been having a rough season, so to have this on top of that is, um, is, is adding to the challenge, but we're hoping that we can pivot and make light of it, as we have tried to do with some of our signs and some of our social media, and um, move forward. Thanks for watching the World Report. I'm Noah Miller, and we'll see you next week. And stay classy, NKU.